having overviewed the network layers data and control planes and understanding the difference between routing and forwarding, we're ready to now dive down deeply into the forwarding function in the network layer. That is, how are packets move from a router's input port to the appropriate output port? And there's going to be a lot of ground to cover here, and so we're going to do this in two parts. In the first part, we're going to look at a generic router architecture to look at the input ports, the output ports, and the switching fabric for moving datagrams from input to output. In the second part, we're going to dive down deeply into the issues of packet scheduling and packet buffering, tremendously important topics. So, there's a lot to cover here, so let's get started. The figure that we'll be developing here shows the major components of router architecture. Let's start with the input and output ports. This is where the physical and the link layers are implemented. The link layer and physical layer might be wired ethernet, optical fiber, or some kind of wireless technology. And of course, key parts of the network layer are also implemented in the input and output ports. The number of ports in a router can vary from very small, say half a dozen in a home router, to many hundreds of interfaces or ports in a backbone router, each operating at many gigabits per second. Packets are moved from the input ports to the output ports under router control through a switching fabric. And this really is the heart of a router. This is the place through which all packets must pass. And as we'll see, it's really a network within a network router. A router also has a routing processor, often just a regular CPU that performs control plane functions, controls the switch fabric, and installs forwarding tables at the input ports as shown here. On this diagram, we can also pretty clearly distinguish the router components that belong to the data plane, that operate at high speed and are implemented in hardware, and the control plane, which is implemented in software and running at slower timescales. Let's now zoom in on the input port. And starting from the left, let's see what we see here. Shown in green here, we see a line termination function. This is really the physical layer. It's responsible for receiving the bit level transmissions over the physical medium, whether it be copper, fiber, or wireless. Then there's the link layer function, shown in blue here, where bits are assembled into link layer frames, like the ethernet frames that we'll study later. And finally, shown in red here, there's the network layer functions at the input port. Packet queues may form here, we'll cover that shortly. But for now, the thing to remember is that the most critical network layer function performed at the input port is the lookup and forwarding function, determining the appropriate output port to which the arriving packet will be forwarded through the switching fabric. This lookup and forwarding is a type of match plus action behavior. In traditional routers, the destination address in the packet's header, that is, the IP address of the destination host, is going to determine the appropriate output port to which the packet will be forwarded or directed through the switching fabric. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. A little bit after that, we'll take a look at generalized forwarding, where the appropriate output port is determined or can be determined by many fields in the network layer header, the link layer frame header, or the transport layer segment header. For example, it's possible under generalized forwarding for packets, say, containing TCP segments bound for a particular destination and, say, coming from a particular source host to be directed to one output port, but have packets, say, containing UDP segments from that source IP address to be directed to a different output port, or maybe not to be forwarded at all. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here, so let's get started with destination-based forwarding. What you see here is a simple example of a forwarding table. And when we think about forwarding tables, the first thing to consider is, well, there are two to the 32, almost four billion possible destination addresses. And we certainly don't want a routing table entry for each possible destination address. So it probably won't surprise you that routing table entries are often aggregated into ranges, as we see here. In this particular example, any packet with a destination address in this first range of destination addresses goes to output port or interface zero. Packets with a destination address in the second address range go to interface one, and in this third address range go to interface two, and otherwise the default outgoing interface is going to be interface three in this example. Well, this all works out pretty nicely and looks pretty simple, but of course the devil is in the details as the saying goes. 
What happens, for example, when say packets with a destination address and some subset of addresses in this first range should go to interface three rather than interface zero? Well, of course we could split the first address range into multiple pieces and then add in this new subrange with its new destination output port. But it turns out there's a much more simple and more elegant way to do this. And this is known as longest prefix matching. Well, longest prefix matching is relatively simple. Instead of using explicit ranges to perform matching, as we saw in the previous slide, we wanna work with address prefixes as shown here. Here we've got a table with four entries. The length of the first prefix here is 21 bits, 11001000000010111000010. That's 21 bits. The length of the second prefix is 24 bits, so it's a longer prefix, and the third prefix also has 21 bits. The stars at the right, uh, they represent wildcards or sort of don't care bits. They're not part of the prefix. They represent the bits in the address range, if you will. And so you can see here that address ranges and prefixes really are the same things. But as we'll see, it's a lot easier to work with address prefixes rather than address ranges. And the longest prefix matching rule works as follows. For a 32-bit IP address to match a prefix, all of the leftmost bits, each and every one of that address, must match the ones and the zeros in the prefix. And among all of the prefixes that match, we want to find the longest one. The longest prefix match is sometimes also called the most specific match, since the largest number of leftmost address bits are going to be matched. Take a look at the addresses here at the bottom. Can you figure out the prefixes to which they match under the longest prefix matching rule? Why don't you pause and think about that? Well, the first example here only matches the prefix in the first row of the table, so that's easy. The second address, though, is more interesting. Its 21 leftmost bits match this third table entry, but its first 24 bits match the second table entry. The longest prefix match is thus the second table entry, and a packet with this address would be forwarded to interface one associated with the second table entry rather than to interface two. If you understand these examples, you've definitely got the longest prefix matching rule down. We'll see shortly that longest prefix matching dovetails really nicely and very naturally with network addressing. Well, as we mentioned earlier, this match plus action is usually carried out in hardware. The matching is often done using what are called ternary content addressable memories, TCAMs, where address is presented to the TCAM and the matching values returned in one clock cycle regardless of table size. TCAMs thus result in really, really fast lookups. Once a packet's appropriate output port has been determined by longest prefix matching, the packet's ready to be forwarded into the switching fabric. Let's take a look at what happens inside that switching fabric. The switching fabric is at the very heart of a router. Its job is to transfer a packet from the input side of the switching fabric to the output side of the switching fabric. That is to move a packet from the input port to the output port that's been determined by the longest prefix match. One of the most important characteristics of the switching fabric is its switching rate. That is, the maximum rate at which packets can be moved from an input port to an output port. If there are n inputs with incoming rate r and the switch has a switching rate of n times r, then all of the packets that arrive in some unit of time can be switched to their output ports during that much time. In this case, packets won't experience much of a significant weight on the input side of the switch this is known as a non-blocking switch. But high-speed non-blocking switches are more expensive than switches that might say only occasionally block packets and force them to wait at the inputs. And so, not all routers have non-blocking switch fabrics. If there's blocking, then packets are going to have to wait their turn to be transferred through the switch fabric in these red boxes here on the input side of the switch fabric. And this is known as input port queuing. Now the topic of how to build high-speed, efficient, economical switching fabrics is itself a field of study. Actually, there are entire courses dedicated to this topic, and so you might wanna take one if you find this interesting. So here, we're only gonna to touch very lightly on this topic. 
As shown here, we can broadly identify three approaches towards switching. Switching via memory, switching via a bus, and switching via an interconnection network. And it's really this latter approach that's probably the most widely adopted in practice. Well, way back in the day, that's to say the 1970s and 1980s, the first routers were really pretty much traditional computers with switching between input and output ports being done under direct control of a CPU, which you could sort of think of as a routing processor. Input and output ports functioned as traditional I.O. devices in a traditional operating system. An input port with an arriving packet would signal the CPU via an interrupt. The packet could then be copied from the input port buffers into processor memory. The CPU would then use the destination address to look up the appropriate output port, the output device, in the forwarding table, and then write that packet's contents into the output device's buffers. And so in many ways, you can see the network ports were really just another type of I.O. device. Rather than moving a packet from an input port to memory, and then from memory to an output port, switching via a bus skips that intermediate transfer to memory and allows an input port to write the packet directly into the output port buffers. This means a packet only has to cross the bus or the backplane once rather than twice, and in this case, the switching speed is limited to be the bus bandwidth. The third type of switching fabric are interconnection networks, and really, these are the most interesting. Interconnection fabrics and routers share a lot in common with interconnection networks that have been used for decades to connect processors together in multiprocessor computing systems. There are crossbar switches that directly connect N inputs to N outputs through N squared interconnection points. But more typically, when connecting N inputs to N outputs, multi-stage switching networks, known generally as CLOS networks, are used. These multi-stage switching networks are made up by interconnecting smaller size switch elements, both serially, that is in multiple linear stages, and in parallel across a given stage. In the example shown here, an 8x8 switching network is made up of four 4x4 four four and four 2x2 two two smaller switches. We'll see CLOS networks again when we learn about how hosts are interconnected in data center networks. Because these switching fabrics have parallel paths from their input side to their output side, we want to be able to leverage these paths in parallel. And so it's common with these switching fabrics to divide a single datagram into multiple smaller fixed length units, sometimes called cells, and to switch these cells along parallel paths from the input to the output side of the switching fabric. The original datagram is then reassembled from those component cells that it was divided into at the output port after all the datagram's pieces have arrived. Well, so far, we've thought of a switching fabric really as a single entity. But as we just saw with interconnection networks, parallelism can be exploited to build high-performance switches. And this idea can be generalized to taking multiple switching fabric planes and using them in parallel, as shown here. And this diagram here is actually a schematic of Cisco's carrier routing system that has a basic unit with eight parallel switching planes each of which internally has a three-stage interconnection network. As you can see, by exploiting parallelism, hundreds of terabits of switching capacity can be achieved within a single router. So that wraps up our first of two parts on what's inside a router. We took a look, a broad brush view of what a router architecture looks like. We saw the input ports, switching fabrics, and output ports, and we looked at addressing in some detail. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna dive down deep into the output ports in particular and take a look at packet buffering and packet scheduling.